If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. Okay, so we're here at Rick P- uh, Ed, uh, I'm going to start that again. <laughs> Rick Peacock Edwards' house, so thank you very much for having me, Greg. Nice to see you, Mike. Welcome. Yeah, so obviously this is happy hour. I want to talk about straight away, what was it like in the bars on Friday night on the squadron? Fantastic. It was, uh, to be quite frank, Friday, ever since I've joined the Air Force, Friday hours, Friday, uh, Friday evenings, or happy hours. Wherever yeah. I was, they varied from one place to the next, yeah. but they were always bloody good mm-hmm. and sacrosanct in my view. Mm-hmm. They, we, I've been to some very, very wild Friday nights mm-hmm. and some quite civil ones too. <laughs> yeah. Um, did, did it differ from like each squadron and each type that you flew on? Yeah. Yeah. I think place. I mean, for example, I mean, the, the first happy hours I really got involved in were when I was at um, Goodersloe in Germany flying Lightnings on 92 Squadron and the officers mess there was a fine German building mm-hmm. and uh, we, had a, we had a bar down there called the Keller Bar mm-hmm. um, which had sort of uh, all sorts of paintings around it, even had a honkatorium there so uh, oh, wow. you know sort of you, you can guess what uh, that was mm-hmm. used for mm-hmm. and it, <laughs> the things that happened down there on a Friday night were quite amazing including I mean, it, it, it wasn't infrequent that the that the, uh, the Keller bar got flooded, quite frankly, because somebody it was down in the cellar something there, and uh, somebody knew how to flood it. So you know, once or twice we've been in water down there. Why would you do that, though? <laughs> I, I don't do it. But, you know, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> somebody does, and when you've got four fighter squadrons there, mm-hmm. a helicopter squadron, and the rest, it gets quite a lively place. Yeah, I can imagine. And obviously when you went into Tornado, what was it like going into the bar with the nabs? Was there a lot of banter between you all? Yeah, there was always banter. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the first 10 years of my flying career, I flew mainly sort of a single seat aircraft. Mm-hmm. So I look at my logbook the other day, in fact, I didn't actually uh, fly with a navigator until I'd been in the Air Force for 12 years. Oh, um, wow. Then, of course, I flew with them throughout my time on the Phantom and um, again on the tornado mm-hmm. and uh, some of them my best friends um, to this day I mean they're, they're, they're a great bunch of um, mm-hmm. chaps they're, they're the same as us in fact I call them where I would term myself as a fighter pilot I term all those who flew with me in the back seat fighter gators mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah because uh, on Facebook there's some great uh, like I think I'm part of a few tornado groups and it's great to see like the banter between the guys oh, yeah. I, I don't yeah. know if you're on them I, th- I know you're on Facebook I'm on Facebook uh, but you're part of all the groups and things like I'm that I'm part of a lot of the groups yeah and I don't sometimes I get involved in a bit of banter but I, I actually find my my days are so full so you don't get time, that, yeah. Uh, that a lot of the time, I just haven't got time to sort of get into a detail, sort of a bantering. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have one, <laughs> one occasion when I got involved, actually, with an- another group in, in Facebook in a bit of what I thought was banter. But I ended up being called a racialist, um, which uh, took me by surprise. Really? Because of something I'd said, which, which, as far as I was concerned, had nothing to do with racialism. But as soon as that, that word was mentioned, I sort of, uh, I, I took down, I posted something on Facebook. Right. Shared, shared something uh-huh. which people took the wrong way so i took it straight off but that's the thing like yeah you can't uh, especially on social media sorry folks i'm just getting my wires sorted here uh, <laughs> on social media you can't do right from wrong it seems whatever you post there's always going to be something wrong yeah 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 uh, especially in our group well i keep it like if anyone gets into politics i just kind of knock it on the head because it's just our groups as you know it's just all about aviation and stuff i don't want any of that to come into it Absolutely right, and yeah. that, that's the way I am entirely. Um, yeah, um, so uh, aviation groups, I'm on lots of aviation groups, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm. Yeah, you should definitely use Twitter more, because uh, yeah, I think you'd be quite good on that. I, well, I've, I've got a Twitter account. You do, yeah. And uh, and I keep on saying to myself, I've got to use Twitter more, and, and I've got to re- religiously sort of use it once a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's my intent. I int- do intend doing it, so watch this space. Yeah, You'll brilliant. see much more. We'll, we'll post that up there for you, uh, yeah. folks who are on Twitter. 
But uh, yeah, what do you think the current uh, state of the REF is like at the moment? Are you do you just, get involved? I'll just bring a, to a, a toast to you first of all, Mike. Yes. Good, great, great to see you. At, yeah, cheers, in, my, Rick. In, in my man cave. Yes. Yeah. So, Rick, what do you think of the the current situation of the REF? Well, of course, since I joined the REF, things have changed greatly. I, I think there were about 140,000 in the REF when I joined, and now it's down to 30,000. And it, over the last however many years, I've seen the sort of REF sort of slowly become decimated and change, you know, and a lot of the change, quite frankly, um, is for the better. I, I know that there's very much concentration um, these days on things like cyber and space and uh, uh, ISTAR, and that's absolutely right too. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, sort of the number of squadrons we've got now, um, Typhoon and F-35 squadrons, and they, one thing I would say is the kit that the RAF has got is first class. Both I those agree. aircraft, not just the frontline aircraft, but also the support aircraft, whether it's the Chinooks and the Pumas, Voyages. or the uh, um, the C-17s, uh, the A-400s, um, yeah. you know, with their new names anyway. Um, yeah. So I, I do think the RAF is extremely well equipped with, mm -hmm. with aircraft. I'd just like to see uh, a few more squadrons. Mm -hmm. I really would. Do, like, let's say, senior pilots get any say in what aircraft's coming in? Like, like for instance, the P-8 and stuff like that, or is it not up to them at all? Well, y yes, we, we do. I mean, you know, we've got, uh, like, I've used an example. You know, we, we've, when we had people in the Ministry of Defence, we had a, a lot of contact when we had a lot of people in the Ministry of Defence, we had a lot of contact with the policy makers and, uh, yeah. you know, we were we were heavily involved with, with uh, policy. So when new aircraft were coming in, yes, we were involved. We're still involved, quite frankly, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there, whether it's, there, there's fewer staff in the MOD, there's star, more staff at um, High Wycombe on the air side now. But of course, there's a lot of staff down at um, um, Abbey Wood mm. on, in the, uh, what used to be the MOD procurement agency. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever they call it these days. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do know. It's just slipped my mind at this precise moment. Yeah. But, but yes, yes, we we do get involved, but uh, we don't make the final decisions. That's that's a political. Decision. It's more like advice, but yeah, you don't get any saying that. We, well, we, we 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 will look at. We we do get involved in looking at all the possibilities, mm -hmm. and um, giving a view, putting it forward a recommendation. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you one example, for example, um, when the Tucano trainer was chosen um, to come in to, as, as the basic trainer many, many years ago, mm -hmm. um, I think that was uh, more a political decision than, than an RAF decision. Right, yeah. Yeah, so we're talking about the happy hour, on, obviously, on the Fridays. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, did each decade differ as well? Was it more crazy back then than it was like later on, where you're told you can't do maybe in the eighties or something like that? Happy, happy hour. Uh, I, I don't know what it's like now, mm. but throughout my career in the air force, and, and I left the air force in, in the year two thousand, where I saw happy hour was different. Was um, if we were in a, a location where you couldn't go home for the weekend mm. or go to another place, like I mentioned, Germany. Mm -hmm. Um, where you, you sort of develop your own sort of social life on, yeah. the, on the base. And to some extent, the, it was the same as when I was at uh, Lucas in Scotland mm -hmm. or Valley in, in Wales. But, you know, sort of when you live sort of uh, one or two of the other places that are close to London, mm -hmm. should, should we say, then you've got people sort of leaping off to the smoke instead mm -hmm. of sort of... So what I'm, I'm not trying... Happy out always takes place, although I think sometimes it takes place on the Thursday night, now we're on... Yeah, Friday night. Um, but so there has been a bit of a erosion, I would say, mm -hmm. over the years. But I would like to think that happy hours still take place because the happy happy hour to me reflects the spirit of the air force. Mm. And the spirit of the air force, again, to me, it goes back to um, my my heroes, mm -hmm. the Battle of Britain pilots. Yeah. Um, and it's very, September the 14th today, it's actually Battle of Britain Day tomorrow. Yes. So I feel sort of doubly sort of uh, privileged to be having this. Oh, crikey. <laughs> so Rick, do you have a close connection with the Battle of Britain or the BBMF? Uh, well, I have a connection with both, in fact. Right. Um, the Battle of Britain, because my father was a Battle of Britain pilot. Mm -hmm. um, I've got his logbook sitting, uh, sitting over there, in fact. And of course, 
tomorrow is Battle of Britain Day, so it's a special time of the year. In fact, this week I'm giving two talks on the Battle of Britain um, around the place as well. But um, suffice to say that um, the Battle of Britain pilots, my father and his, the others, who were the few, they were my heroes when I was a youngster. Mm -hmm. To be quite frank, they're still my heroes today. Mm -hmm. And they have driven my attitude to life. And if I talk about the spirit, we talked about happy hours and the spirit of the RAF, um, the sort of thing that depicts their spirit and my spirit are things like happy hours on a Friday night. Mm. That, to me, is the spirit of the RAF. Um, and it goes, to me, it goes, to me, it goes back to the Battle of Britain, but I'm sure there are plenty of others that it goes way back before then too. Yeah, because one of my favourite pubs I've been to, I'm guessing you probably have, is the Eagle in Cambridge. Yep. Yep, that's great, and the history on the ceiling is amazing. Yep. I yep. love all that. Well, I've been to, I've been to that, and separately because of my passion for the Battle of Britain, mm -hmm. um, I've um, I with the business partner we we run a little organisation called Battle of Britain Tours. Okay, um, right. And um, we arrange tours to Battle of Britain sites um, uh, around the country, and I'd, I've done this quite frankly. I, I'll give you the story. In fact, I was um, some years ago. I was thinking we've got all these magnificent places associated with the Battle of Britain, and um, but I'm not aware that people know as much about them as they ought to. And, I, and I'd listened to people talking about battlefield tours, whether yes, it's in Normandy yes. or South Africa or what have you, and I thought I'd never heard anybody talking about Battle of Britain tours. And I did, did a bit of investigation, and there was no such thing Which as Battle really of Britain odd, tours. isn't it? And um, I, I am aware that, you know, in, in, in isolated places, they have their own little sort of micro tours around their areas yes, and what yeah. have you. But there is so much to see, um, and, and even more now, because in recent years, a huge amount of money has been spent, whether it's the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust, uh, where the memorial is down at Capel La Fern in Kent, which has got a magnificent new building there called The Wing, um, which costs five or six million pounds. But the, the location of it sits on the, on the cliffs down there. You can look at France, you can, you can just imagine the battle it's a fantastic place they have a thing there called the scramble experience which is everybody's got to see it's just brilliant um, and then you come to uh, Biggin Hill of course with a name like Biggin Hill um, there's the there's so much to see at Biggin Hill whether it's the heritage hangar there or the Battle of Britain Museum and the chapel and what have you uh, again a lot of money's been spent uh, yes. at Biggin Hill uh, and then I come to my alma mater, which is Bentley Priory, which was the home of the where Fighter Command was um, during the Battle of Britain, Lord Dowding, and uh, where I've served when I was um, Inspector of Flight Safety. But um, they've got a magnificent building there. Again, millions of pounds have been spent there on preserving the memories of the Battle of Britain. There's the Battle of Britain Museum at Bentley Priory. And again, it, it's, well, it, it's, it's brilliant. It's well worth going to see. And then at Uxbridge, there, where the bunker is, there's the bunker, which was where the um, Sector Operations Centre was. That um, It's still there, underground, um, and at the top, uh, the, it used to be uh, run by uh, RAF Uxbridge, and they closed RAF Uxbridge, and Hillingdon District Council now sort of have uh, control of it. But to their credit, and they spent a huge amount of money, I'm not quite sure whether they raised it or, or what, but it's about £6 million, and yeah. they, they built a new visitor centre at the top of the bunker at Uxbridge, wow. um, which again cost five or £6 million. And it's f all these places are full of virtual reality and things like that. They're, they're, they're an essential place to see. And then you've got the pubs. We went to, talked about the Eagle Pub yeah. in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And there are, wherever there was a Battle of Britain squad, there's an associated pub and things like that. Those places to see. And there, there are other places, Duxford, North Weald. Mm -hmm. You know, I could go on. But there is so much to see. So we put together some, some tours. And in fact, the last one before the lockdown, we showed some Americans around a, a, a five-day tour, and they had the, we, they had the time of their lives. We had the time of our lives too. It was really fantastic. Yeah. So, I really when I when I hear things like that, uh, a lot of the youth today doesn't even know what the Battle of Britain was. Um, yes. Yeah. And I think you know what, what what that means to this country. They they are where they are now, and they're speaking the language mm -hmm. we're speaking. Because the invasion of uh, the German invasion, planned invasion of the of the of Great Britain, was stopped, um, yes. and the Battle of Britain was critical in that. 
and the role of the RAF, not just the RAF, but I, I mustn't forget the Navy either. They had mm. quite a, a role, but there were so many, so many people involved in that sort of, that had a role, as well as the the few, the 2,937 pilots who are the few. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. You know, I was going to talk about this, the F3, it's my yeah. favourite. Yeah. Um, there was one for, I don't know if you have it, yeah, there it is, was that the, the Queen's birthday, uh, was it the fly, uh, fly pass? Yep, yep. Um, yep. I've always wondered this, why were you not in 67 wing, because I think that would have just looked so cool. <laughs> well, we were in 45 wing. You were in 45, because, yeah. Uh, why were we in 67 wing, because, you, it, yes, I agree. But we would have really had to be going a bit, much, a bit, uh, right, a bit faster. Okay. Yeah. And 67 wing, you are not, it, it's harder in formation and you are not as manoeuvrable in 67 wing as you are in 45 wing. 45 wing was a nice sort of compromise um, position. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that, uh, that yes, I, I led the Queen's 60th birthday fly past. And the, the, the photograph you see there is of uh, nine Tornado F2s. Um, now, there's nothing too special about nine Tornado F2s, but what's special about that is we only had 10 F2s <laughs> delivered to the RAF at the time. Yeah, yeah. And in actual fact, we got all 10 airborne. Um, wow. every, every aircraft we got airborne, and we had a hydraulic failure. One aircraft had a hydraulic failure, so we did use all the aircraft. But that, that believe me, in my view, was quite an achievement. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, the engineering feat just to keep, yeah, when they were kind of brand it new. It was an engineering feat to get them all into the air, mm -hmm. all 10 aircraft. Um, and it was a it was a nice day. I'm pleased to say. Yeah. Um, but it, something like that takes an enormous amount of organisation and preparation. Mm -hmm. um, and that was no exception. Uh, it's uh, funny enough. I, I do give a lecture. I did a bit of, do a bit of cruise ship lecturing, and one of my lectures on cruise is all about air displays and uh, fly pasts. And w w what I do it is why I do it is to really talk about what happens behind the scenes. Yeah, because when you see just a bunch of aircraft up there, they're there, but it's getting them there in the first place. Yeah. It's what happens behind the, behind the scenes that's the important bit. Yeah, because I think like obviously like the general public who are not interested in aviation, they probably just say, "Oh, that's that's pretty, oh that's nice," and then get on with the day. Whereas yeah. an aviation fan will be like, "Oh, that was brilliant." But then it's even, like you say, like the behind the scenes is even more interesting, like because it's not as simple like uh, yeah, jump in and we'll go. Yeah, uh, it's uh, that, that fascinates me. But you know, just talk about the tornado game. That, that was the fly pass. Yeah. But um, you mentioned uh, my association with the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight mm -hmm. that we run. But that relates to the tornado as well, because um, I was the first RAF pilot to fly the, the fighter version of the tornado, then the tornado F2. And I and uh, three other crews did our conversion with British Aerospace at their airfield at Wharton in mm -hmm. Lancashire in two courses. I was on a first course with another pilot. Um, both of us were ex-Lightnings, and, uh, and, and I was also ex-Phantoms, and um, with our navigators, who were all Phantom navigators. Um, and then, so did that January, February, into March. End of March, flew back to Coldshore with a third aircraft that was delivered to the RAF, third F2. And then, then at, uh, we started flying immediately because we'd had two aircraft there since the end of mm -hmm. the previous year. Um, and um, we did quite a lot of flying to start with, but then my air officer commanding, um, one Air Vice Marshal Ken Hare at the time, he called me up one night and he said, uh, Rick, it's the 50th anniversary of the first flight of the Spitfire this year, 1985 it was. He said, um, wouldn't it be good if we did a, a synchronized display, the old with the new, the, uh, um, the Spitfire with a Tornado F2? And I said, I'm all for it. Because what I had discovered, even though I've personally been flying the aircraft for only two couple of months really mm -hmm. um, it was an easy aircraft fly it was a delight to fly quite frankly so I said yes and then we, I got together with uh, Paul Day from the BBMF we worked out uh, that we could do it fine um, and I was squadron commander so I wouldn't normally have done this um, it would have normally gone to the other pilot but it just so happened that one Friday night, going back to Friday night mm, yeah. at Coningsby, he was cycling back uh, home after um, a few bevies at happy hour <laughs> and he fell off his bike <laughs> and, oh, and, cool and, and was concussed and, and therefore all flying for a little bit. So then there was one pilot, me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why I flew the Tornado in the synchronised display for a year. It was the first one that ever happened. And it was a fantastic experience, really brilliant experience. Yeah, because that picture's in your book, isn't it? It's in the book. Yeah. 
at the end of at the end of the year, the then air marshals um, were looking at. I mean, it was a Lucas Air display, in fact, and uh, and I was up there with, and they they looked at the uh, tornado and the Spitfire flying in formation, and they said they, you know, knew lightnings and phantoms, which couldn't fly as slow as the as the tornado, mm -hmm. and they said, well, oh, it doesn't look real, you know, fighters shouldn't be flying in formation like that, um, so it was it was not allowed to go forward into a second year. It did come back again after mm -hmm. a while, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it at all, um, but. Um, so, but but it was absolutely no problem to fly in formation whatsoever because the tornado being swing wings, you know, we put the wings right the way forward mm -hmm. to 25 wing, as we called it. Mm -hmm. um, and you, we also had a maneuver flap on the leading edge of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the aircraft. And the aircraft could fly very slow and was very maneuverable, mm -hmm. perfect for flying in formation like that. Anyway, the other thing that happened, so, so we only did the one year, but BBMF came to me and they said, Rick, we'd like you to come and fly um, our Spitfires and Hurricanes, which of course was my father, who was a hurricane pilot in the Battle of Britain and beyond. Um, and so I would have loved to, to have done it. But my then station commander, because I was introducing the tornado into the into the service, forming the, the new squadron, building up the, uh, the force and and, you know, rightly so. I mean, he, he said to me, he said, Rick, no, you haven't got the time. And and it, it would have been lovely to do, but he was absolutely right. Yeah. So it never happened. But I'm the um, first honorary member um, of the Battle of Britain um, Memorial Flight Association. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. Well, that's a, definitely a privilege, yeah. Yeah. So I'm very proud of my association with BBMF. Yeah. Um, um I think you, I think, yeah, the picture's also in the book. I think, I can't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, there's a Lancaster and I think a Spit. Uh, uh, what, I can't, where were you at there? I'll, that tell you what that, I'll tell you what that was. That was a, that's a unique photograph, one of the, one of the really unique photographs I'd been in. That was a fly pass we did at um, RAF Cottesmore in 1985, I think it was again. Yeah. yeah. That was, and it was a Lancaster a Spitfire. A hurricane, and I in the tornado F2 was in the box position. Yeah. In that. So it was a very unique photograph. There's grits in the F2 just like that. Yeah, <laughs> in the back, <laughs> ready to go. Yeah, because I think uh, the picture's really great because uh, there's a GR1 at the time with a guy just on the back, and then you just see this photo. It, it's a great photo. I love it. That, that that was a unique photograph, and that's the only one that's ever been taken that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. There's another photograph that's unique. I'm not sure it's, whether it's my book or not. I think it is. Um, and that was, I've, I've always had a big association with air displays. Mm -hmm. But on this particular occasion, in 1986, um, I led a mixed um, formation from um, 11 Group, which is the old fighter command, basically, um, over Mildenhall. And mm -hmm. that consisted um, of um, Tornado F2s and 3s, Lightnings, Phantoms, and Hawks. And that was unique, that because yeah. the lightning was uh, um, going out of service fairly fairly soon. Mm -hmm. um, but it was uh, I, I can't think of another formation that um, shot was ever taken with those four aircraft involved. Yeah, is that why it looks like it's coming over a hangar or something? Uh, it looks like it's coming yeah, head on. Was, that, is that something that, else? Uh, is that a, that's another one. There's one over. Yeah, there, there is one taken on. Uh, as we came back from Milden Hall, and um, we overflew the hangar is at Coningsby, that is the squadron hangar of 229 Operational Conversion Unit, as That's it was cool, then, yeah. um, also known as Number 65 Squadron, which was the yeah, yeah. squadron, which is now the home of the um, Typhoon um, mm -hmm. OCU mm -hmm. instead. So did you ever take a camera up like during your like whole time flying or were you just not that into photography or anything? Well I was into, no, the, the answer to that is I didn't, I, if, if, if there were photographs to be taken, remember I <laughs> I had backseaters, like, yeah. and you know, one, you know one of them very well. I do well. indeed. Uh, yes. David, he's a good, good friend of mine too, he is, yeah. David Ledhill, mm -hmm. he was a very fine backseater, mm -hmm. he was an, a, and a damn fine chap mm -hmm. uh, all round. Um, but he was a great uh, taking photographs, and there were others too. Mm -hmm. So there was no, never short of people who were taking photographs. I didn't myself, um, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, 
in those days we didn't have things like webcams and things like that yeah i always thought like back in those Go, you know GoPros the gopros in and, oh yeah. wow that would have been incredible that, exactly that would have made all the difference yeah because i think it was still wet film then wasn't it back uh, till a certain point there was probably no digital until yeah. like mm. probably mid 90s but don't quote me on that i'll get in trouble for that but um yeah but like because i'm i don't know if you're gonna let me do this take a few photos you can take you can yeah take, just so i can show the guys because like uh, the if you, yeah you'll be able to see the phantom one behind us could you just describe that for us rick because that, that's incredible i've never seen that one that, before that's that's well that's fairly unique and that was a nice surprise to me i've got a very good friend who actually used to fly we were both in we're, he used to fly hunters, I used to fly hunters. Um, we used to instruct uh, together at Aria Valley. He was instructing on the hunter, and I was instructing mainly on the net, or, although the hunter a bit as well. And then he went off to Buccaneers, and, and I went off back into the fighter world. Um, and um, he's been a good friend ever since, since he, he, he then joined BAE. His name's Mal Grossi, for those who remember the name. He's now a really good artist, mm -hmm. and I see a lot of him. And he was, an, until recently I was vice chairman of the Royal Air Force Club in London and I'm still involved with the Arts Committee. Art has been something that is of great interest to me and Mal was down there, he'd been doing some paintings for the RAF Club pre to present them and unbeknown to me he'd done this painting um, to present to me. Now that's a very special painting, it, it, it's, uh, it's of two uh, phantoms in trouble one squadron markings so that was they, we were based at Lucas and, and that, that particular painting, it's got all the right ingredients. It just reminded me sort of a, a sunset, sort of an autumn sunset as we go out over the North Sea where most of our flying was done. Um, and it's just a, a lot of realistic and it's a lovely photograph, a lovely, not a photograph, it's a lovely painting anyway. So that was a nice little surprise, that one. It's incredibly detailed as well. It's, yeah. it's especially the, the burner, that, that looks great. Yep. But, yep. Um, yeah, like because you mentioned like the RAF club there. Do you ever get to like squadron reunions or type reunions or anything like that? Much? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, I left. Uh, yes. I mean, <laughs> in many ways, I I, don't, I feel just as associated with the Royal Air Force today as I did when I left in the year two thousand. I mean, I've done lots of things that have kept me associated. It, so you don't it, feel like you've lost that connection at all? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I certainly you know, and I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people, and uh, no, I feel totally, totally, really, um, I won't say I'm, I'm not operationally up to speed, but I'm up to speed with the people and what's going on in, in big picture terms. Mm -hmm. and, and I see a lot of the people, and I certainly see a lot of them, my old friends. I see a lot of people. I mean, people is my, is my life. I'm, I'm a real, I would call myself a real people person. I, I cannot do without people contact. Yes, that, <laughs> you, you're definitely a very personal guy. But do you mix with like the new guys at the moment on their any the new types? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yes, through another um, on visits. For example, I'm I'm a past master of the Honourable Company of Air Pilots, which is a big company in, in London, part of the City of London uh, mm -hmm. Livery Movement. And uh, we have affiliations with uh, a lot of um, RAF squadrons and um, uh, Army Air Corps, for example, and also the Navy. We're, we're affiliated with uh, HMS Prince of Wales. So we, get, we, we do get on to, around to seeing these people and places. And for example, you know, with, the, with that organization, I've been on visits to Lossiemouth, um, uh, to Valley, to Wittering, you know, so, and to Coningsby. There's plenty of opportunity to get out and, 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 and about. So, yep. Mm. So do you never like, just want to sit back, right? I've had a great career and just relax, pour yourself a nice wine, or you like you like to keep busy? Well, I certainly pour myself enough, <laughs> enough wine. No, <laughs> That's a different enough. story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I mean, and, and talking about that, I mean, with this <coughs> lockdown that's been going on, one of the things I've really enjoyed has been the social media that, that uh, mm. were and use of Zoom and uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft Teams and Skype and other things. And um, I don't mind admitting that, um, in fact, I've got one coming up uh, early this evening. Mm -hmm. um, I get involved in quite a few what I would call virtual happy hours. Virtual which, happy which, hours. Which are sort of, uh, yeah, they're happy hours, you know, get togethers of old mates to talk about things. We talk socially, we talk about business things because I've still got a very big involvement with air displays mm -hmm. um, and, and other things, but it's always done over a 
glass, Why not, yeah. glass, <laughs> glass or two or even more. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind how the night goes? Yeah, yeah I think uh, every time we, because you've been on uh, for a Q and a, Q and a few times now, and I think every yep. time you're like, after this, I've got another Zoom. I'm like, bloody hell. <laughs> uh, but but to ask your question, really, and it's an interesting one. Um, you know, when I left the Air Force at 55, I, I said to myself, well, first of all, I said, what do I want to do? I, I said, do I want to go and do something totally different or do, do I want to stay involved with aviation? And it was, I don't know why I even asked, the, asked myself the question, quite frankly, because I said, I've had such a fantastic life in aviation. Why would I want to change my involvement? So, so that was the first decision made. I want to stay involved with aviation. And I did in many, many different ways. Um, and then, and I, and I said, well, I think I'll could probably afford to retire the way I want to retire when I get to 63. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to 63 and I said, do I want to retire? And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, right, okay, well, I'm not going to put any figure on it. I'm just going to go on. I mean, I'm technically I'm retired now. I don't feel it, I'll tell yeah. you that. So, <laughs> Busy mind. Because I'm, I'm, I'm still involved with so many different things. Mm -hmm. uh, one or two things as chairman and, and mm -hmm. other things. So, so, and I don't mind that. And, I, and I've really come to the conclusion now that um, it's very important to, to stay involved, to stay um, involved with people in particular. And I've already said, I'm a people person. Mm -hmm. And that's what gives me pleasure out, out, of, out of life. My, my involvement with people. Brilliant. No. Cheers again. Yeah, cheers again. Mm. So, yeah, as we're here, like, I like a nice beer, but what, uh, what do you like normally? Are you a wine? I used to be I used to be a, a beer drinker. Mm -hmm. These days I, I don't drink too much beer because I find it fills me up. Yeah. So I drink I drink uh, the occasional gin and tonic like every night. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all right, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> all three of my children live around here. Yeah. But my two of my children have just come back from uh, our villa in Croatia, okay. um, which is a magnificent place. But um, because of the quarantine rules, they're in quarantine. So we we had a we had a family happy hour on uh, Saturday night. Oh, brilliant! Um, on uh, on on a social media facility called House Party. Oh, I've heard of House Party. It's yeah. good. It's yeah, I've never good. used it. Yeah, mm. yeah, because I um, my parents live in Singapore, but uh, we we haven't really. I may suggest that actually. That Should, I mean, I, and only last night um, I spoke to. Uh, I had a had a Zoom um, session with my brother in South Africa, down in the Cape near Cape Town. Oh, very nice. So yeah, I mean, it's, it, I just think that it's brilliant the way it's opened up the world. Oh yeah, it is. It is great, and I think I think uh, things like Zoom, especially or, or any kind of that kind of format, will change the way we do business in the future. Yeah, uh, I think it will change. Uh, meetings and change you know you don't have to go all the way over there to you know just chat yep. about nothing it'll be over that um yeah because i've done a lot of skype interviews but i was doing that years ago and um, i just wish now uh, i bought some shares in zoom <laughs> before the lockdown <laughs> I, I do agree i mean you've seen they just published their recent results and i mean they, they, it's grown astronomically i know yeah should have gotten early but uh, yeah let's move on um so do you are you a fan of like because obviously you've got plenty of books in here but are you a fan of like the you know the air force magazines and all that kind of thing well yes yes i am mm -hmm. um but i do find that um i i i like these magazines therefore be they air force magazines or other magazines um i often find i get them i get a number of them but i don't always have time to read them mm -hmm. because i'm so busy rushing around mm -hmm. the place and doing things um but one, the, the one I really enjoy at the moment is uh, um, the magazine Aeroplane. Aeroplane, oh yes. Which yeah. Ben Dunnell is the editor. I know Ben very well, mm -hmm. you know, through his commentating and air displays mm -hmm. and things. Yeah. Um, but I like his, I like his, uh, like Aeroplane. Mm -hmm. and, and there are others too. Mm. Yeah, I used to buy them, but not so much anymore. Because um, I used to like going into Smiths and picking it up myself yeah. rather than getting delivered through the yeah. post. I like that, you know, quick flick through and bring yeah. it home. So, but I haven't had the chance recently. But because uh, I saw one, I think it was on the Concord recently or something, and that was really great. But a weird connection here, if you don't know, you and John Hutchinson are friends because uh, yep, because uh, you worked together at Duxford, didn't you? Um, well, uh, we're both uh, we met each other through the Honourable Company of Air Pilots. Mm. Where we're, we're both past masters, in fact. 
Oh, wow. Um, and we, we are good friends. And, I mean, he lives very close to Duxford. Anyway, he does, so, yeah. So I'm at Duxford all the time. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we see each other. We see a lot of each other and mm -hmm. we talk a lot. Duxford uh, Museum's amazing. It's, uh, it's quite interesting because when I've, I've always was going to write a book, um, I was wondering what I was going to call it originally. And I, and I thought, well, thinking of my lightning days in particular, I, I, I thought, um, I think I'll call it um, Always Supersonic. And I was speaking to John Hutchinson and, uh, and, and we talked about books, his book and my book. Mm -hmm. And he said, what are you going to call it, Rick? So I said, I think you're going to call it Always Supersonic. He looked at me and said, said Oh, come on, Rick. You guys were only supersonic for minutes. We were supersonic <laughs> for hours. I thought to myself, he's got a point. Yeah, he's got a point there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it's very true, yeah. Um, yeah, so how long could you go? Let's say, okay, um, how long could you go supersonic in the Lightning, Phantom and Tornado, if you can give a rough time? Oh, well, I would say if you were supersonic for longer than... In, in, in the Phantom and the, and the Tornado... If you were supersonic for longer than 15, 20 minutes, you were running out of fuel. Mm. If in the lightning, if you were supersonic for longer than five to 10 minutes, probably you were running out of fuel. So you're going to say seconds there. <laughs> uh, I mean, no, I mean, the lightning was, particularly the early days when we had the short range lightnings, I think the ones without, with just little yeah. ventral tanks mm -hmm. underneath. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, a supersonic sortie was 20, 25 minutes, mm. and that you get that was getting airborne. You go a long way in that time. You're going very fast, very high, and then you've got, you've got to. It, it, it's a real judgment exercise because you've got to make jolly sure you've got enough fuel to get back on the ground again. Mm -hmm. We we did, but I mean, it, the lightning was a real. It really taught me a lot about airmanship. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, because it, was it uh, like a big difference? Obviously, the lightning, you had to be on, I mean, you all had to be on your game for everything, but that, because it was like really like the first supersonic jet and it was like really analog. And then coming to the tornado where you had a, a bit more systems, was it, could you see the difference there between the lightning and the tornado, just complete generations? Oh, oh absolutely. Mm. In fact, you could see the difference between the lightning and the phantom and the phantom and the tornado. Yeah. The, the, oh, right, okay. Oh, yeah. I didn't think there would be a big difference between the lightning and the phantom, to be honest. I didn't there think was. There, well, there, put it this way. Uh, there wasn't, between the Phantom and the Tornado, as far as I was concerned, in certain things, like for forgotten engine performance, mm. the Lightning's engines were just fantastic at, at all heights. Mm. Um, the, the, Phantom was, the Phantom and the Tornado, were, their engines were really mainly designed, as far as the RF is concerned, for uh, low-level operations. Mm -hmm. um, and so we used to run in the medium levels, to high level, they ran at a puff subsonically. Mm -hmm. But um, going supersonic in both those aircraft, once once the aircraft was supersonic, they leapt away again. They were mm -hmm. like they were like real thoroughbreds, mm -hmm. um, and they were they were brilliant. But where you could really see the difference in the tornado, for example, was in the uh, the design of the cockpits, mm -hmm. where we had TV tabs. We called them. They were TV screens, yep. which were you put all sorts of things on them. Um, and in the avionics in general, the the use of computers, um, and uh, um, it was a, 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 it, the tornado was just the most delightful cockpit that mm -hmm. uh, that I've ever flown in. The quietest mm -hmm. aircraft as well. Mm -hmm. Phantom was a real war machine. I mean, so what I'm saying really is, where you saw the difference was in avionics and computer power, where things were very similar was in the engine performance um, and the, I suppose, the, you know, the maneuverability and things mm -hmm. like that. But of course, the Tornado has swing wings. That mm -hmm. made a difference as well. Um, and also in the weapon carriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Phantom, the Lightning would carry only two missiles. Mm -hmm. um, the Phantom would carry eight. <laughs> the Tornado would carry eight. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a huge quantum leap forward there mm -hmm. and the gun capability in both those aircraft was much better than the lightning as mm -hmm. well mm. so when you were like on squadrons and stuff did you always have to live on base or could you choose to live somewhere else no you could you could you could live off base and, and many okay. people did live off base but what we did have you had to be you know we had to be back in cold war days you had to be available um to be, you could only live in places where you could get to the squadron mm -hmm. in, in a, a certain time limit. Mm. 
because we had to get P get the crews in, we had to get aircraft on state, and we had to meet NATO uh, declaration requirements because mm. it was all a bit in Cold War days. It was a bit busy. You had to you had to be ready to react very mm. quickly. So um, you could live off base, but and, and of course you know you hate people will go and leave. So it would always be sort of uh, a judgment exercise. You had to keep a certain percentage of the pilots always available, ready to um, be called into the, into the squadron. Mm -hmm. So you could only ever have sort of cert a certain number on leave at any one time. Yeah, because it must have been quite loud living on base. <laughs> oh, it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not bad noise. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was, it was great. I mean, living on base is another thing that's, um, it's great for socialising, it's great for uh, um, the officer's mess too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but of course that, you, you, I've watched it progressively change over the years. Mm -hmm. I watched the days when I was a bachelor. You had, when I first joined the Air Force, as a bachelor, you had to live in the officer's mess. Right. Just like a hotel, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> yeah, can't complain <laughs> um, about that. You know, well, I had, you know, I had a, I had a Batman. <laughs> um, I had all, all my meals um, there. The bar was there. The people were there. <laughs> I had my shoes cleaned. I had my <laughs> um, washing done. Yeah, it you is know? like a little hotel, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> then you go and fly jets. <laughs> All changed. All changed now. <laughs> oh, I can imagine, yeah. But, uh, yeah, this is going to sound a bit like nerdy, but uh, what was the loudest aircraft out of the ones you like, flew, do you think, especially like when they fly past or taking off? And they're all generally the same, but there's the one that really stuck out or an engine noise that you like or preferred. Um, I've always found that, sort of, you know, once I've got the bone dome on my head and the engine started, which is normally behind me, mm -hmm. um, that... Um, you know, it, it really becomes quite pleasant mm -hmm. and you don't, in, in the cockpit, you don't tend to hear what you hear outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, loudest wise, I think probably on takeoff, the lightning was the loudest, mm -hmm. I, I think. Um, in the cockpit, the quietest was definitely the tornado. Mm. And the Phantom was probably, the Phantom was probably the noisiest of, of, of mm -hmm. them all, in fact, I think, but the noisiest cockpit I've ever flown in. I think was the the Viggen. I flew the Viggen in Sweden. Yeah, I've seen a little thing over there. Yeah, 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 I had. Uh, I was inspector of flight safety, and I used to go to Sweden quite a lot, in fact. And a fascinating place, and it was really interesting. Yeah. Um, and um, I had uh, I flew in a Viggen, and uh, if if you've flown a, a Viggen, you become a Viggen, what they call a Viggen brother. Right. And I was um, indoctrinated as a Viggen brother after I'd had my flight at the party in the evening. And is that uh, what the picture uh, is? That, that's the picture there. I'll, I'll put that yeah. for you to see. <laughs> wow. So yeah, what was the Viggen like? Viggen was lovely, it was, but it was it was quite noisy aircraft. Mm. But you know, it, it it felt a bit clattery inside. Oh really? But it had it yeah. had powerful engines. Yeah. Oh yeah. The Viggen was Viggen was an interesting aircraft. Yeah, I think mm. it was powered by a Volvo engine, if I'm correct. Probably. I can't remember, like that. remember exactly. But the, the loudest, probably the loudest engines I've I've ever experienced. I mean, I think the SR-71. I was never lucky enough <laughs> to see that. <laughs> that must have been, when did you see it, Milton this, Hall? Well, um, I was thinking mainly sort of places like um, Riyadh. I was, I used to help out down at Riyadh, Royal International Air Tattoo for about uh, nearly 20 years down there. Mm -hmm. But the SR-71 would invariably sort of fly there and you would come across and its party trick would come across and as it came across, it would just plug in the reheats. And boy, when those reheats went in, you felt it. The, you felt it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like a spaceship as well. The sight yeah. must have been amazing. It was. It was a big aircraft, a big, powerful aircraft. Mm. Yeah. So obviously, you've been around what, the air what, show scene a lot. I mean, what I am surprised about, I mean, you know, I, I spent years, years and years and years, um, living with aircraft noise, and in the early days, never had any um, things to put in ears and things like that. And quite a lot of my friends do have sort of uh, hearing aids now, and a, and a lot of it goes back to uh, the noise, the aircraft noise from those days. Yeah. So I feel, uh, personally, I feel very lucky that um, my ears don't seem to have suffered in the same way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so you've been around a lot of air shows. What's the favourite yeah. aircraft you've seen display? Um, Probably a tough one, but... Well, I like them more, in fact. <laughs> we'll give that as a given, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll be, I'll, I'll be quite honest. I think it's got to be the Lightning. The Lightning, yeah. Yeah. I think the Lightning of an air display is just fantastic. Um, it's, you just see the sheer brute 
power of the aircraft. The short, it looks like a short stop. Um, I mean, I've seen YouTube videos, but it did look a great display. It's a great display, but but I mean, they, they, they all are. I mean, I think the Typhoon does a great display. Mm. Uh, I, having seen the F-22 from America, that does a great display as well. The Russian aircraft, you know, the, when, you, when you see aircraft sort of uh, doing loops on, on its own tail. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's difficult it's to a, say. Yeah, it's a really difficult yeah. one, yeah. Mm. Shouldn't ask an aviation enthusiast on <laughs> that question, but what I was surprised about, I interviewed uh, one of the F-16 Viper Denos in the USA, and apparently they're very, very strict. So each year they stay to the same routine apart from maybe one or two manoeuvres, which I was really surprised about. Didn't know that. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. Yeah, because like, I remember I saw the F-16s came over at Riyadh, and they were, like, I was... Like, it was a still a great display, but I th I, they were, seemed to be quite high compared to the Europeans. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, like, their rule, or is that a rule for... Well, they do fly to their rules. I mean, well, the one thing I say about the Americans, and they, they fly, when they fly in formation, they fly very tight formation and, and very good formation. And the Blue Angels, for but they, yeah. The Blue Angels, the Thunderbirds. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they, they perhaps sort of don't... They use a bit more sky in doing what they do than shall we say the red arrows? Of course, yeah. From what I've seen, yeah, and they don't change as much and stuff like that. No, no. Um, but then you know, I, I don't know. I don't know their rules too well. I mean, I obviously know the red arrows very well. Mm -hmm. I know it, all the um, air display people in the UK and Europe, for that matter, mm -hmm. very well. So, yeah. <laughs>